Okay. Um, hi, I'm Rachel Connor, and this is a series where I interview students in the College of Arts and Sciences about their internships. Uh, so today's intern is Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Rachel. Thank you. Um, so do you want to start by introducing yourself, your major, your minor, where you're from? Yeah, um, so I'm Catherine Peck. Um, I'm a political science major and a food systems minor, and I'm from Virginia. Awesome. Um, so can you tell me a little bit uh, about your internship? Yeah, so I am the Native American Reservation Research Intern at the Rural Turnout Organization. And so basically my position, the RTO is a very new organization. And so they're really trying to examine like what avenues they would be effective in in organizing and increasing rural turnout as the name suggests. And so um, my job is to research the biggest Native American reservations in the US and understand voting patterns, what affects turnout, what organizations are already on the ground mm -hmm. and stuff like that to be able to inform uh, decisions on you know what kind of work we'd be able to do in those places in those communities in the future. Cool. So I asked you before this started, um, but where is the rural turnout organization based? So it's based in Massachusetts, um, but it is a nationwide organization, and because it's really trying to get in all the nooks and crannies of all the places people normally don't canvas, don't reach uh, in rural America, you know, in the next few years, hopefully you'll find us everywhere from Massachusetts to Alaska. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what reservations have you been trying to reach to improve voter turnout? Like, are there specific ones um, that are like the major ones that you're trying to reach? Yeah, so there are 18 reservations, over 6,000 people in the United States. And um, so based off of that list is kind of like what I've gone through to um, talk to leaders, talk to organizers in the area. So most of the um, research that I've conducted has focused in a few states. So Arizona, I've focused on in the Navajo Nation, which has about 156,000 people, the Hopi Nation, San Carlos, Fort Apache, and then the Tohono Ono Reservation. Um, and Arizona is obviously like a swing state. It's very important, basically decided the last election. And so, um, you know, it makes, you know, it's having such a high Native American population very important. Um, and then I've also looked a lot in Montana. So in Montana, you have the Blackfeet Reservation, the Flathead Reservation, the Fort Peck, and the Crow. And so those are all like really big reservations and Montana is projected to become more of a swing state. It's been pretty Republican, but they have a Democratic Senator now. And as the population's growing, it's actually the, they're expected to get a second um, house seat in the 2020 census apportionment, which should come out soon. They're late because of COVID but it's expected to become a much more competitive state. And then in addition to that, I've talked to uh, people in South Dakota. So there's four major reservations. There's the Rosebud, Pine Ridge, Standing Rock famously, and um, the Cheyenne River reservations. And so all of those which make up most of Central and Western South Dakota are like very important places that we are looking at. And then let's see North Carolina. Um, yeah, that's another big one. But those are the major ones. Yeah. Oh, New Mexico. That sounds like a lot to keep track of. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so being in Vermont right now, what is it like reaching out to so many different places across the country? Um, the time difference kind of sucks. Um, everyone I talk to is basically on mountain time. And so most of my conversations are late in the day after I've done all of my homework and stuff all day. I get to have these like interviews and stuff, which, you know, I'm kind of like joke complaining about, but they're like the most exciting part of my day. And I really enjoy doing them. So it's a nice like little like 4 p.m. pick me up. And for them, it's like lunchtime. Um, <laughs> So that's been a little bit annoying, just like, you know, time budgeting, but it's, uh, 
it's pretty cool. Most people don't expect someone from Vermont to be calling them or you know, from a Massachusetts organization from a, my Virginia phone number. And so they're usually pretty confused, but I've had a lot of great conversations. Yeah, that sounds like it could be really, really fascinating um, and a really good learning experience. Um, so on the Rural Turnout Organization's website, I noticed they offer both research and finance internships. Um, and you're doing research on increasing voter turnout on Native American reservations. So why did you choose this area of research? So I was really interested in the RTO's mission. I told my boss um, in my interview, it's the easiest cover letter I've ever had to write. Um, I have spent a lot of time uh, living in rural areas and, you know, connected to, you know, I myself am not Native American. And, you know, I also told my boss in my interview, if you have a Native American candidate, please choose them. Um, I'm just like interested in it. I care a lot about it. You know, I think anyone who pays attention to the news can see that whenever there is some big social issue, our Native populations are the, get the short end of the stick almost every single time. And, um, I used to work in Wyoming, right outside the Wind River Reservation, which is another big reservation. I think it's about eight or 9,000 people right in central Wyoming. And like, there's a, you know, it's a very jarring time, like living in a small town next to this big reservation and it feels almost segregated. It's not the right word, but you know, it, it was very like impactful for me. And I've spent a lot of time like out West. And so I was really interested to like learn more about, um, yeah, like what voting means in like extremely rural places and how, um, you know, how these like patches of you when you look at precinct level data in these states generally the reservations are big blue islands in otherwise pretty red states and so like there's a lot of potential there you know um because the rural turnout is a uh, organization is progressive um yeah I, so i was really interested in like you know what can you do to unlock even in like state and local elections maybe not federally um like to unlock that potential for people who like don't get a lot of um, attention from kind of like mainstream organizations. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I can imagine how like voter turnout for areas like that could be really important, not only in the local elections where I'm sure it's also important, but like the fact that, um, you know, you were just saying about Arizona in like the literal presidential election, um, that's a really big difference. Um, yeah, so what are some strategies that you've learned help voter turnout specifically for the Native American reservations, but also in general? So um, in the, with the activists who I've talked to, the organizers in these areas, that's like the central question I ask them because we want to make sure that the tools that the RTO can bring to the table are ones that are needed, that are helpful, you know, that are wanted. Um, and it's really difficult because there's all sorts of different types of barriers to voting. And so some of those are your classic voter suppression things like in North Dakota up until 2018, you couldn't use your tribal ID to register to vote. And that's really uh -huh. difficult. Yeah, if you live in like a rural area, it's hard to get to a DMV. And if the documents at the DMV are not in a language that you're super familiar with, and you might not have like same kind of documentation on hand that you could, and then you can't vote with the one ID that you do have, it's, you know, it's very difficult. And so stuff like that is out of the purview of the rural turnout organization. And one thing that was very difficult in doing these interviews was realizing like, there's a lot of things that we're not equipped to handle. You know, that was a suit that the ACLU ended up bringing against the state of North Dakota. And it's great for a big organization that does litigation to be able to do that. But, you know, like we can't do that. You know, we want to go door to door. We want to like try to get people to register. We want to like you know, help get people to the polls. Um, we can't at this time at the organization um, make this like huge effort on like these judicial fronts, you know? Um, so there's a bunch of issues like that um, 
that are like very voter suppression, you know, same thing, gerrymandering. It's another big thing. It's like, even if you can vote, like if your vote doesn't mean anything because of the way your districts are drawn, like that's a, an issue in and of itself. But the on the ground organizing issues that we come across, um, one of the big things is mailbox access. A lot of people do not have a post office near their house and they don't have a physical address. Well, they have a physical place they live, but not an address. You know, a lot of folks will, you know, describe the place that they live. They'll be like, oh, I'm the third house on the left after the, you know, 283 mile marker on the highway. And like, you just can't write that on a, a uh, voter registration form. And mm -hmm. so, and that's another one of those things where it's like, you know, the Rural Utah Project actually does a great job of trying to get addresses that you can register with in uh, Utah and Arizona and the Navajo and Hopi nations. But it's something out of our purview now. But even if you do have an address, a lot of post offices or mail carriers don't deliver so you have to go to the post office, but if your post office is 50 miles away, you're only going to go maybe a couple times a month. If that, you might share a post office or a PO box with, you know, several families and there's like slow turnaround on sending in documents. And um, there is this issue in South Dakota. I was talking to OJ Siemens at Four Directions, which is one of the biggest um, Native American turnout organizations. He was saying that one of the biggest issues is people have difficulty filling in their voter registration forms properly, especially if the registration forms are not, are only in English. And then they're supposed to uh, send you a letter to say, hey, you filled this out wrong. You know, you have until this time to change it. But it's like if that, if you have a month delay getting that letter and then being able to send it back, you know, it's it makes voting very difficult. And so, you know, in COVID, you had all these issues with absentee ballots and everyone was really pushing absentee ballots. But for people living in like extremely rural areas, you know, I think a lot of us East Coasters don't realize how rural a lot of these areas are, you know, people whose houses are miles and miles and miles apart, you know. And yeah, so there's this big push for all these absentee ballots because of COVID. And then that just compounded this issue. And then with in-person voting, getting to a polling location, having enough polling locations in an area is difficult in and of itself. And a lot of locations, you know, you'll hear a lot about ballot pickup and drop-off services. So, you know, going from house to house, picking up the ballots. Um, a lot of counties have limits and states have limits on how many you can do that because they don't want it to be seen as ballot harvesting, which really like neuters the ability of organizations that are trying to increase turnout um, with, you know, rural voters, because that's, I mean, people can't always take two hours out of their day to drive somewhere to vote or even to drop off a ballot, you know? So those are like the biggest issues um, that I've found. And one thing that I think is very important to note in the Native American community and just rural communities in a whole, when you talk about turnout rates, all of these issues are so cumbersome for rural voters. And a lot of people from urban and suburban areas might think that people don't vote out of apathy, you know? just, oh, you know, I don't care, whatever, you know, a lot of people only vote in presidential elections, but it's really not true. And one of the things I found researching Native American organizations is, you know, I found a study showing that out of every, like, minority group, Native Americans have the highest rate of civic engagement. And so, you know, even when, um, there are barriers to voting, they still have high rates of engagement in doing things like participating in like protests and social media campaigns, joining local organizations, mm -hmm. and like doing like civic engagement projects just in general. And so, you know, that presents an opening of, okay, like there's civic engagement, but then there's barriers to voting. How do we get from point A to point B, you know? Yeah. 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 That's a lot of problems <laughs> I never even thought of. Um, thank you for educating me. Um, so you seem very, very passionate. How did you get into this subject area and like 
just political science in general? Um, yeah, uh, so I've always been a political science major. I came into uh, college as one and I still am one today. Um, I guess like, I don't know, I grew up in Virginia and so DC is a huge influence in Virginia. Um, I interned on Capitol Hill when I was in high school actually. And that was really cool. That was really impactful. But it um, it was very stressful. It was very, um, you know, th there's a big difference between the politics of Capitol Hill and kind of, you know, state houses and that kind of like end of electoral politics and then grassroots organizing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I think about the issues that I'm most passionate about, which for me are like voting rights, the democratic process, uh, the environment, you know, climate change, stuff like that, like the biggest inspirations to me have always been the grassroots movements because that's really the like cogs that turn the machine in a democracy and should like spit out good things in Washington. But it, I find it more compelling, more interesting to work on that end of uh, the political process. And so like, when I got the email, you know, saying like, oh, like rural turnout organization is hiring. I was like, perfect. <laughs> That's That sounds like right up my alley. And, you know, like I said, I've lived in lots of rural places and really seen a lot of these issues. And so, you know, I was like, great. <laughs> Yeah, so like post-graduation, um, do you think you want to go into more of a grassroots um, side of politics? Yeah, it's interesting. So I um, I have a job lined up, a paralegal position, but I don't think I want to do that for forever. And I'm actually planning on moving out to Montana. And it's been very interesting interviewing all these people in Montana and looking at all these organizations in Montana, kind of back of my head, making a little list of like, hey, like there's some great organizations doing really cool stuff. I could really like, you know, keep doing a lot of um, this kind of work, especially like 2022. It's the annoying thing about political science work is it's all like election cycles, election cycles, election cycles. Like 2021 is kind of like lame, unless you're from Virginia where we where we have off season elections. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Um. So, kind of pivoting the conversation a little bit. Um, how is the College of Arts and Sciences involved in your internship? Like, do you have a mentor? Um, so I am in AS190. Mm -hmm. So that's the like CAS one credit thing. Um, and at first I thought that AS190 was just going to be like, okay, just say how many hours I worked and stuff. But we have all these little assignments that I've actually found really helpful. Um, you know, I finally got around to making a LinkedIn page, add me on LinkedIn. Um, it's, uh, it's been really helpful. I have like 30 connections now. Um, so it's only up from here. Um, and then I'm actually really excited. Our assignment for next month is interviewing someone who has a job you'd like. So I actually have an interview set up with my boss for next week. And I'm so excited because like, you know, she founded a nonprofit. Like how, like how the hell do you do that? Like, I want to know. It's super cool. Um, so it's, and I really like my boss too. So I'm excited to have it kind of an excuse to just like sit down and like talk to her about all these questions that like, you know, we don't, I don't get to ask her, you know, in our normal meetings. Yeah, definitely. Would you ever want to start a nonprofit yourself? It sounds very daunting. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I've never really like thought about it because, you know, and I talked to my boss about this all the time, you know, it's not one of those things, it occurs to you that you can just go out and do, but you can, yeah. you know, so it's definitely made me rethink that, you know, if like further down the line in my career, I find something and I'm like, why isn't anyone doing this? Why isn't anyone focusing on this? And this is what I care about most. Maybe I would. It seems like you've got the right energy for it. So I thought I would just mention it. Um, so, how has your experience in this internship uh, been affected by the pandemic, especially because I know I'm um, looking at the organization's website, um, 
it talks a lot about how face-to-face -face connection is really important for voter turnout. And so how has that been <laughs> with COVID? <laughs> Yes, an astute observation. Um, it's really interesting. I've done a lot of canvassing to, uh, before, and you know, obviously, I do research right now. But it's in the hopes of one day canvassing in these communities, um, whether me or you know someone else down the line. And it, it's a huge, you know, there's like you know volumes of research into how effective having a face to face conversation with someone, even someone you like really disagree with, is really, really effective in getting people to change their minds and motivating so much more than conversations online or anything like that. And especially when you're talking about rural communities who a lot of times don't feel listened to, I mean, that's huge. Um, and so it's definitely difficult in a bunch of ways. One, strategizing going forward, you know, hoping, we don't have another pandemic at any point or this doesn't like you know impede work that we might want to do like i mentioned in virginia in 2021 um yeah later this year but also it means that all of the interviews that i've been doing about people and all of their work for the 2020 election have all been very deeply informed by the pandemic and like that's a interesting thing to talk about because it's like you know strategies shift so much when everything has to be no contact and it's helpful to know about that but at the same time like if we're planning for 2022 2024 and there isn't a pandemic well you know we need to know what works like when we can go door to door uh because that's like a very different type of strategy you know yeah, um but i think i've been incredibly amazed talking to um, other organizers and hearing how quickly they had to adapt to everything, you know, some of these organizations that have been around for decades and having to pivot, you know, immediately to try to address um, COVID and in their work and still be effective for, you know, such an important election. Yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> it was incredibly impressive. It's incredibly fascinating. Um, I hope we don't have to do it again, um, but it's been interesting. Yeah, those are all the questions that I have for you today, but was there anything else you wanted to talk about before we wrap things up? Um, I do want to mention, I run the RTO's Facebook page. If you want to give them a like, please do. Um, you can read all the articles I post every week. Um, that's it, though. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Great. So to everyone at home, stay safe. Um, follow UVM's College of Arts and Sciences social media if you haven't already. We have Facebook, Instagram, and also TikTok. Um, and that is UVM underscore CAS. Um, and Catherine already plugged her social media to follow. Um, so thank you again for joining me. Um, it was a great chat. Um, and I will be back next week with another intern. So bye.